I know I'm blasphemous now, right? Okay. We're dictated. If you don't have somebody who's out of the box and if they're working in managed care and you're under the age of 75 and you've got high cholesterol, the answer is you've got to be on a certain medicine. You're not going to reverse coronary artery disease and your all cause mortality is probably higher. How many times have I put an elderly patient who wanted it because their cardiologist told them, put them on a certain medicine and they started having mental issues? It happens more than people realize. And the answer is, we don't look at the medicine, it's the age of the patient, and it's just supposed to happen. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, good morning here. Is this Dr. Brian, how are you doing? Yeah, it's Dr. Brian. Hi, Brian, Brian, okay, hey, okay. A pleasure. Good to see you. Can you so see you see me well enough? I can see, I can hear you. Wonderful. So thank you for doing this, by the way. Um, you are, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but you are in what, Boca Raton or something? Pompano Beach? No, I'm actually in uh, the lovely city of Davie, which is greater Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Okay. Well, I was, I was literally just there like two weeks ago. I was, I spent a week in, in Fort, in Fort Lauderdale and it was, it was quite pleasant. So we went up and visited Boca Raton, visited somebody up there as well. So yeah, Boca is a, a beautiful place. It is nice. So you are a, a geriatrician, is it correct? I'm a geriatrician, internal medicine. I I went to school in um, Tel Aviv, Israel. I got my medical. I did medical school in Israel. I did my internship in New York at Beth Israel, and then I worked down here uh, in um, in the Great Fort Lauderdale greater area. And somewhere along the line, I felt actually I was getting ready to do the boards again, and I fell onto 4 a.m. And what I liked about that was the fact that uh, instead of being told a drug, I was being given biochemistry and possible ways to treat things in a more a natural way or maybe even get solve the problems. And so I went down that route and uh, finished up with 4 a.m. And then this this world has been an uh, interesting place this last couple of years. So I'm I'm, I'm actually technically sort of semi retired. But I've been helping out with patients here and there that have uh, difficult cases and consulting that way. And myself, I've been a carnivore now for almost about two years. Wow, interesting. Um, I, I don't know what 4 a.m. is. What is that? You mentioned that. Okay, 4 a.m. is sort of an, an anti-aging uh, education. It's not recognized by sort of the, I would say, the standard boards of medicine. But they 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 go into the cosmetics, they go into the alternative treatments where uh, you can use roots and you can use vitamins and different ways of treating certain problems and, um, so, and, and giving the biochemistry and the education that way. Okay. So um, it's sort of, uh, it, it, through that, it was very interesting because there's a lot of ways to treat things besides just giving a, a medicine, so to speak. Yeah, for the people who don't know, geriatrics is is the 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 you know the, the treatment of the elderly, basically for people yeah, who aren't familiar. Most with that. of my babies, I call them babies, are between the age of eighty and one hundred and five. Wow. Yeah, and and, and they're living life full. They're living. You know, I know people. You know, theoretically, they say the the real middle age. This hurts me, by the way. Uh, is really the ages of 30 to 40, the huh. 50 where, you know, if you look at the actual lifespan, ouch, but these guys are out there proving us wrong. That's good. And Florida is, is, is definitely a place where you got a lot of the geriatric patients. It's, it tends to be a, an older state. People go down there to retire more or less. And so it's, it's interesting to see what got you interested in geriatrics in the first place. How did you go from internal, because internal medicine is kind of a mishmash of everything. And then you kind of maybe well, specialize. The, the answer is, is, you know, if you're dealing with young adults, they come in with a sore throat. That's it. And there's no real tug with that. You know, my average patients would be diabetic, heart disease, some degree of dementia, absolute arthritis, kidney dysfunction, peripheral arterial disease, and, uh, and, and, and going on from there. So it was, um, it's when you're dealing with a problem, it's, it's so much more going in and playing with, you know, making sure that you give one medicine, you don't have a problem with another. 
and finding a way to make their quality of life better. It was just more, more challenging. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Because you're they're interesting people. They've got a they've got a life of stories to tell you. Yeah, that is that is that is neat. I, I remember I, I had a eighty uh, three year old that I did bilateral hip replacements on over a stage over a period of six months, and she was uh, someone that they made a movie about her called The Year of the Caribou, and she actually lived out in the Canadian or not the Alaska wilds up in the north off the Car- Caribou for twenty years with her husband isolated, and she said she was the best she'd ever felt in her life. It was interesting. It's kind of wow. this is the years before I ever thought about a carnivore diet, but it was just an interesting uh, perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, you mentioned all these you know, diabetic, peripheral vascular disease, cardiac, you know, congestive heart failure, dementia. I mean, is that inevitable? Is that, is that something every all of us are going to experience and it's just a matter of when, do you think? It, in my opinion, I, I, if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I would have given you a different answer. Mm-hmm. Today, I will tell you, you know, I, we've heard it before, you are what you eat. And in my opinion today, if you change your ways, you can reverse so much of this. I had a gentleman, and I, again, the problem here, I think, in when it comes, first of all, we're up against an indoctrinated society. Everybody believes fat is bad, meat's bad, and vegetables are king. And to me, that's... You know, I, I wouldn't say that, I, you know, I was guilty of having that mantra as well. But since I have learned about carnivore and since I've gone carnivore and since I've practiced that with the patients I have, I've seen nothing but reversal of the health problems. I had a wonderful gentleman, I won't mention his name, 320 pounds, diabetic, kidney stones, hypertension, sleep apnea. Never controlled with his blood pressure. He's on, he was on two medicines, uh, maxed out on his diabetic medicine. Never controlled. His average sugars were running way over 200. And he really wasn't serious in the beginning. And I said, listen, all I got to, for you is we, we can do more medicines. We're not fixing anything. If you don't make a change, you're, you're, you're going to get what you get. So he decided to follow my thought process and he became a carnivore. And to my impressive surprise, within two weeks, he was off his blood pressure pills. His blood pressure was running 120 over 65. First time in his life, he felt better. And uh, his sugars were not perfect as yet, but his pre, pre, uh, pre-meal pre eating, the sugars were running in the 120, where he was never in the, he never had a 120 in his finger sticks. And he, and in, in less than a month, he lost 17 pounds. So this, I mean, Sean, the way I see it, you're, you're probably one of the oldest guys out there trying to get the messaging. And, uh, I think, I think it's the, the most important message out there. There's really two approaches. You can go to uh, what I call the protocol doctors and they're going to give you medicines that are going to um they're going to maintain your chronic illness and you will see them forever more and you will not get better or you can change what you're doing change what you're eating and you'll you know you're, when you switch over to carnivore there's there's a an adjustment period at least a week of it where you you're going to go through a little loose stool if not constipation and and the one thing that I see, you know, I, I enjoy listening to you. I enjoy listening to a lot of the other doctors out there that are pushing this. The one mistake that I see pretty predominantly coming from most people starting carnivore is when you cut out the sugars, they go to high protein. It's not high protein, it's high fat. And if you don't do the high fat, you're going to get all those terrible symptoms of nausea, dizziness leg cramps, constipation, et cetera. So pushing the fat is really where it's at. And um, it's it's really quite, um, it is the solution for a healthier America. And that's why I, I was so looking forward to talking with you because I really believe that you've been doing a, a service 
beyond, above and beyond pushing. Again, in this world of, of medicine today, it's risky to be pushing anything against the mantra. Yeah, was, yeah, we're seeing like in California, they're, they've passed a law that if you as a physician speak against whatever the, 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 the theme of the, the, the month is, then they can take your license, which is, I mean, it, and will that be exported out to other places? I mean, it, it is seemingly in, in, in Florida, obviously being an exception right now with the current political climate out there. And yeah, I agree. That I got to tell you, Sean, yeah. that's a bit of a misnomer. Yeah. I mean- the the government here has made laws, but there's still a free for all. I mean, if you were if you were in Florida two weeks, you st- I mean, compared to certain other areas, uh, most people are walking around without a mask. But there's still a slew of people wearing masks, and pretty much any medical office you're going, they're still in, in you know enforcing the masks. And one of my biggest complaints here is the is these mandates, I mean, as far as the government is concerned, he has allowed, he, the laws have changed, but he's, if you don't, inf- what good is a law if you don't enforce it? And if you allow companies, private companies to enforce vaccine mandates, mask mandates that we know are insanity and are, and are not the solution and taking away people's independent ability to make their own personal choices, uh, it, it's not real. So we're, we're not in Florida's not, you know, we have these laws, but they're not nobody's being protected. If you're a doctor, for most part, you're running, you're, you're working for a corporation down here and you have to be vaccinated. If you work in a hospital, you have to be vaccinated and they're still forcing the masks. Yeah, it's difficult to difficult to to see that. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where you know, I mean, it, it, it's it, it, for as long as I can remember. I mean, as a surgeon, I give people informed consent, and they made the choice based on what they felt was the right thing to do for them, and they're taking that away, which I think is uh, a very slippery slope, as to, as is no doubt. I, I just you know, I just looked at a thing in Canada where they they offered a twenty three year old diabetic kid the ability to be euthanized. I mean, it's just like, well, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it's kind of crazy. You know, not, not, yeah, it, it, it really, it's life is precious. And if you change what, you know, if, what was it Einstein used to say? If you, ex- if you expect to do the same thing and get a different outcome, you're special. And, <laughs> and so to me, if anybody's listening, get beyond your whatever emotional thing you have. Do a switch and give yourself a trial of doing the carnivore for a month. And I don't know a patient that will not feel better. I've had patients with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, IBS. I've seen them all, all their symptoms go away. And it's just amazing the difference. My mother, she thought I was special and uh, had, she's a nurse practitioner. She had a great issue initially with what I was talking about. And she finally did it for herself. And um, what, what's amazing is she had a little rosacea. It's gone. She was constipated most of her life. It's gone. She feels better. She's sleeping better. She will note, and I'm thrilled by it, that her cholesterol, her total cholesterol is off the roof. Her LDL is off the roof, and I could care less. And But if you take her triglycerides and you look at her HDL, her HDL is 135, and her triglycerides are 65. And if you do the, you know, the dividing of the tr- the HDL into the triglycerides, her ratio there is less than one. And she's zero risk of heart disease. And when you do the LDL particle size on her, she's LDL type A. So, if and for those that don't know what I'm saying, 
you with the LDL, you've got a small type of LDL, which is not a good sign, and you've got the large fluffy LDL, and the type A is the large fluffy sign. Yeah, there's people that would vehemently push back against that and say that it doesn't matter. It's all about particle numbers. And it's the larger, largest, larger ones contain more cholesterol on average, and 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 on and on. And I know this is a very contentious topic, but it it, it is the battle. It is. It's you know because you see people who obviously their quality of life has gone in just immensely better. You know, no more ulcerative sort of colitis, no more depression, no more Crohn's disease, no more rheumatoid arthritis, no more constant debilitating pain. And the trade-off is their cholesterol goes up. And so somebody said, well, theoretically, they're at higher risk for heart disease, which may or may not be true. And I think it's it's a battle that, you know, I think it's it's something. And, and I agree that, you know, um, I, I have gotten over the years, you know, I've been called every name in the book, you know, from, from Hitler incarnate to, you know, something like that, just because I'm saying let's, let's promote a, a diet that seems to be helping people, uh, in, in a number of ways. So thanks. For, and I'm gl- glad to see other people are taking up that fight because I think it's a fight worth having. And, um, let me ask you what, I mean, you said five years ago, and I'm the same way. Ten years ago, you'd ask me, I thought, yeah, carnivore diet, that sounds crazy. I mean, I'd never heard of it ten years ago, but I would have thought that for sure. What got you, what was the switch that made you go from, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the, the eat a lot of vegetables and, and, and whatever to, to carnivore a couple of years ago? Well, I, I have to say, people who knew, knew me before, I, I mean, honestly, I'm a healthy guy. I don't, I, I mean, I was maybe overweight during... Uh, you know, during the years of working crazy hours at the hospital and and in the office, et cetera, I could say that I used to sit down and eat an average salad of Romanian lettuce, cauliflower, broccoli, olives, mushrooms, tomatoes, cucumbers, balsamic and and olive oil every day. And um, to be honest, I, I I would be bloated like I was nine months pregnant, and I was musical. And uh, for keeping it cute and um i never appreciated that i was getting the my body's telling me that something's wrong that that isn't a good sign and i have to give it to covid covid19 where because of the situation and i ended up not being in the hospital and not being at the office and just at home i had so much more time to study and get into it and 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 again, these are taboo conversations on a certain level, but without going into it, I started treating people for COVID back about May 2020, May, June 2020. And I was looking out to some of the people out there looking to see what China was doing and everything like that. And so I started, I mean, I have to go back to Dr. Bartlett out of out of Texas who came up with a, a certain protocol. And I have to say it, it worked phenomenal. And so I went that route. And since I saw that things were working differently, I also wanted to see what else is. And um, as I, I began looking at nutrition, um, I have to give it to, um, it's Nina Teichholz, if I'm pronouncing her name, correctly looking at the the american diet rules and seeing that they're really there's no science there and then i stumbled on the carnivore i i saw one of your videos i saw one of uh i saw i i got so i saw it and i said you know what i want to know more and i read paul saladino's book and what i, I i've always been a glutton for liking mechanisms or liking research if you if you give me a science paper I'm going to go look up the paper itself and and read it myself. And so that's where I got into carnivore. It just made sense to me. Yeah, it, it it well, like I said, it, at the end of the day, when you see the results, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna interview a fellow who's running a nursing home out in Arizona, and he's got you know he's got obviously a lot of older folks and a lot of people that are just in there for bad health reasons, morbid obesity. He's actually feeding them a carnivore diet, and they are. As I'm sure Moving. you're not, sir. I'm sure you're not surprised. They are getting healthy, and they are they are coming getting off their medication. Healthy. Yeah, it's amazing. So I mean, you know, I mean, are you still seeing a lot of? You said you're kind of part time now. A lot of your older patients that are that are doing. So what, what I've diet? done is I've gone into a because of the way because of the ability to practice is is limited if you're not going along with certain issues in the protocol. I can't prescribe something that I know is going to hurt you. 
and do you and not and do something wrong. And so if I'm if I was to go back to work, there's we have what I call protocol medicine where we have to prescribe certain things. I'm just not saying what they are because mm-hmm. it'll it'll cause issues. And so I basically don't accept insurance anymore. I just do a VIP service. And so I go to patients' homes or wherever they are, whether it's telemedicine or home visits, and I take care of them that way. And I'm still taking care of anywhere from 18 all the way to as long as you live. And I sort of help them get the better medicines and get the better way. But again, if I can get them on the carnivore and they go that way, I tend to take them off medicines as opposed to add medicine. Yeah, that's and 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 I can't begin to say, you know, I get people if they're if somebody had to choose, I believe carnivore is the best. If you can't do carnivore and you're still cut on it, go keto. You're going to end up carnivore when you learn enough. Yeah, it just seems to make sense. I mean, if you if you sort of resonate with the physiology and the science behind a ketogenic diet. And then you look at, well, how would humans have been on a ketogenic diet over time? And, you know, the, the obvious answer was, would have been kind of fatty cuts of meat. You know, I mean, there's nothing else. We didn't have quest bars and keto cheesecake brownie bites or you know, whatever people are doing today that, that didn't exist, you know, even, even a few hundred years ago. So it's, uh, um, yeah, it does seem like a natural progression. Many people go that route. Um, you know, it's. It, it, I do think the nice thing about this this last couple of years with 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 this COVID epidemic pandemic, uh, it has caused a lot of people to reevaluate who they trust, what their sources are, and 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 you know when you look at that and you realize that maybe the CDC, maybe the FDA are not necessarily infallible, and and maybe there is some I reason do. to cause concern there that, that you can you you know you question a lot of things. Yeah. I don't know, you know, the way I see it, I was told I couldn't see my patients anymore because of COVID. And it, it just made no sense to me. I said, what do you mean? Listen, I've seen infectious disease my entire life. I, I worked in the hospital. I went in for tuberculosis, which is infinitely more infectious. And so why are we suddenly getting crazed about something that you know, 99% get and get better without seeing a doctor. So it was hard, but the overnight, the American medical establishment basically abandoned their patients and said, if you're really sick, go get tested and go to the hospital. And, you know, and the fear of going to the hospital. So it was a real problem. And so that really sent me down the education line. And so I think if, if, if one has, an autoimmune disorder, one has hypertension, one has all these different issues. I'm not going to say that you do carnivore and they're going to disappear in a week, two weeks, a month. You didn't get to where you're at in three days. You didn't get there in three months. You spend 10, 20 years of eating bad food. So it's going to take time to reverse it. But um, the more you learn, the more you realize that so much of what we're being, so much what doctors have been pushing is incorrect. You got to remember as physicians, we've been pushing cholesterol medicine for 30 years. Nobody's reversed heart disease. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. And and for maybe you guys don't know that maybe you're aware of this there, they're actually look working on a vaccine to, uh, to address cholesterol. And so they can do a, a vaccine against, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cholesterol synthesis or cholesterol, uh, you know, the PCSK9 uh, gene, I believe, is, is being targeted as a, as a vaccine, which I am very concerned. You know, you can imagine oh. if they put that on the childhood vaccine schedule where every kid gets a, uh, you know, an anti-cholesterol. I mean, I'm not saying that's happened, but it's, it's, it's within the realm of possibilities, which is quite, quite concerning. It's, 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 for me, it's scary. It's, it's frightening. It's frightening. If, you know, there's a, like yourself, there's a wonderful doctor online by the name, a cardiologist by the name, name of Nadir Ali. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know Nadir, yeah. And, and he really spells it out beautifully. And I, I have stolen his, his famous statement of, is cholesterol really the arson burning down your house or... Is he the fireman trying to save you from yourself? And if you step back from a moment from the mantra 
and you look, what does cholesterol do for us? Without it's it's essential. You need it. And so to do a vaccine that's going to block this, this is just going to take people's health away. It, it's wrong. We're we're you know again, if you, I, I'm just positive from all the research that's coming out that the doing away with cutting back significantly on any type of sugar is the answer. And you only got two fuels. You got sugar and you got fat. And, you know, and an interesting thing is some of the studies that are coming out. I, I, um, there's a, I'm sure you've heard of him, Professor, I'm probably saying it wrong, but a Professor Nopes out of South Africa. Yeah, I, I've talked to Tim several times. Yeah, I know, I know yeah. Tim as well. Yeah, and sure. one of the things that they've been seeing is that when you, you know, I, I think of this with all the guys I used to know in the gym who would be doing the protein drinks without any fat and you ingest the protein straight off the bat, you get it absorbed in the small bowel, but it stimulates the, the uh, sugar and the insulin, which is what we don't want to be happening. So if you take your protein with your fat, it gets absorbed differently and it doesn't stimulate. And uh, so from a standpoint of great health, you got to cut back on the sugar. You got to push the animal saturated fats. I even question whether, you know, I have a few friends who are still avid vegetarians in the sense that very knowledgeable, but they're getting their saturated fats from different sources of like coconut. Uh, through olive oil, coconut oil, etc. And what, what I mean, I, and, I, and this is just anecdotal. Like I can't say I'm. There's right. I just question this. Is that when you look at their their bodies and look at their chest X-rays, here this is as a young man in his fifties, and he's got orthostatic vascular disease of the aorta. He's all calcified. So my question is, maybe that's. Maybe we're, there's just so much more studies that need to be done to tell us really what's going in there. But I kind of believe that we need the animal saturated fat. Uh, let me ask you, just change gears a little bit. As someone who dealt with a lot of the aged people, uh, uh, dementia is is becoming more and more common. Did you notice, I mean, I, I you know, there's people that suggested that, that things like Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia are just brain insulin resistance you know brain diabetes so on and so forth and i know like my grandmother at 95 she passed away at 95 of basically uh, it, alzheimer's disease she was you know in the latter years of her life perhaps the last 10 years she had an unsatiable craving for sugar she just wanted to eat sugar cookies cake all the time do we see a relationship between those with dementia and and a, and a profound desire to eat sweets and sugar are you seeing that absolutely absolutely totally inflammatory no question about it and you know there's an argument that there's there's an argument out there that if you cut you got to remember your brain is predominantly built from fat and cholesterol you need that to support all your neurological processes and despite what people think you don't need sugar your brain your body will make as much sugar as it needs and the brain will function better. And by doing away with this inflammation and by giving it the, 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 the cholesterol, the fat that you need, you're going to be able to support and, and repair the inflammation that's going on there. I, I do question that there's so many medicines that the elderly take that are detrimental. And this is where, you know, as a physician, I've been a, a legal drug pusher, and now I'm trying to be a healer. And I'm not saying that all medicines are, you shouldn't use any medicine. There are medicines with benefit, but there's a lot of medicines doing harm. I'm trying not to throw you under the bus on YouTube, but <laughs> if you take the, <laughs> if you take the best cholesterol lowering medicine and you actually look at it, there's no benefit in mortality. Yet, if you cut off the whole cascade of uh, things that are made from cholesterol at the at the right at the the top of the chain, you shut down everything that the body needs 
to repair itself and fix itself. This is the other genius of carnivore, just a thought to remind you. Ultimately, the greatness of our, the carnivore is that you get to intermittent fasting. And if you stop eating for 10, 12 hours, your insulin comes down, your inflammation comes down, your, your repair system starts to take off. Try to fast while you're running on sugar. Good luck. You probably have much more willpower than me, um, but you're not going to last long on that 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 process. You you just won't be able to continue doing it for any length of time. That's why so many people do diets. They're on it for two weeks and then they gain everything back three times. But when you're consuming seventy percent animal fat, your appetite's shot. You're not hungry. It's easy to fast and not eat because you're just not hungry you're not interested and therefore your body can repair and heal and that's the real genius behind the carnivore that you're getting all the essential things that you need you're getting the essential amino acids you're getting the essential fats and the minerals of course that you need but you're giving your time you're giving time out we've been so indoctrinated that you got to eat three meals you know, back in the day when I was going to the gym, oh, maybe you should be eating six meals a day. And there's nothing better than doing that to keep your insulin through the roof. And insulin, in my book, causes weight gain, increases your appetite, and gives you the inflammation. And it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, obviously insulin has a role. I mean, if we look at a type 1 diabetic who can't produce, if, if they're not supplementing insulin, they they rapidly wither away and, and end up dying. And so we, we, you know, there's this difference between hyperinsulinemia, which is this constant chronic, chronic overstimulation versus, you know, a, a baseline minimal amount. And, uh, let me ask you as far as, you know, I mean, is there a, I know like the, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, is there a similar body governing body or patient advocacy group for the geriatric community? Are there, is there a, is there a, you know, American Board of Geriatrics, and, and do they recommend a certain diet? I don't know that they, I will tell you that it, it pretty much doesn't matter what board it is, unless you're gone into the anti-aging realm, like 4 a.m. Or, or, or into um, different alternative roads of medicine. But if you're in standard medicine, the mantra is Mediterranean, per se, and as you know, with the American Heart Association now, they've done a very quiet, partial 180, where they're saying that some animal saturated fats are okay. You know, some, you should have some, but not go too crazy on it. They haven't made, uh, they didn't want to come out and, uh, because prior to that, they were completely against it. But if you truly delve into it, they're all following the American diet rules, which are based on observations that have no basis. The, uh, I mean, is it still something, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this in the hospitals. I mean, they would supplement a lot of these uh, for protein, things like Ensure and Boost, which are these liquid drinks that are basically, I think they're like corn syrup and soybean oil and some sort of maybe, maybe milk protein. Is that something you saw being pushed significantly? The way I saw it is the hospital foods were always designed to keep you in the hospital. <laughs> Here I eat during the days that I'd be treating somebody for diabetic and I'd see what they get to eat in the hospital. I'm going, I can't believe they're getting all this. I mean, here it is. I'm trying to control their, their sugars and they're getting orange juice and pancakes in the morning. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, and you're absolutely right about the insure. It's terrible. Yeah, oddly enough, and this is sort of just totally weird, but I had a, a dream last night. I was in the hospital, and I had a patient, and literally they had a, an all meat diet option on the on the on the hospital menu, which I thought was, you know, it's it's. I don't know if that'll ever get to that. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we can we can prescribe carnivore diets in a hospital? I think it will. I think it is coming. As you see, you know, it's hard to say where this world's going, but I think there's so many people who are waking up and trying this. You know, one of my big issues when I first started this was, oh my God, this is going to put me in the poorhouse. I can't afford meat every day, steak every day. And 
actually, I spend more, le- more less on food now than I did before. And I, I got three kids there. They come and go. But, you know, when you start buying fruit and you start buying all the different things for lettuces and all the different sauces, and all of a sudden you don't need any of that. You just need your steak, hamburger, whatever you're eating from a meat source and salt. My fridge is filled with, you know, heavy cream. And I do have a cheat. I love my coffee. I do my bulletproof coffee every day. And that's my cheat. So I got tons of heavy cream. But beyond that, all I got in that fridge is meat. Yeah, it is actually when you think about it, you know, even if you're eating, you know, some steak, when it comes to saving money, you're actually not spending so much. And I, my, my fridge looks like, you know, mostly mostly steak. There's a bunch of eggs in there. I went and bought 120, 120 eggs yesterday. Uh, it's kind of funny. The Costco's are now restricting how many eggs you can buy. You can only buy yeah. two, two containers. So I buy the, I buy the five, do- five dozen at a time. And then I buy two of those. So that's 120, 10, 10 dozen eggs. And that'll last me, you know, last me about a week. And then I go back and refill. And so it's, uh, but it is, it's actually, it's actually can be more economical to be on a carnivore diet than, than a standard diet where you, where you're spending, like you said, ridiculous amounts of money on organic fruits and vegetables and, and other things for sure. You know some of the things you've seen. You'd mentioned uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diabetes. What what do you see any any efficacy for mental health? I mean, this is something that's a really very topic, uh, important topic because it's so common now. We see something like a quarter of Americans are diagnosed with with a mental health disorder. Are you seeing efficacy you know, for diet? My on? approach, my approach today, with all my for the not all the patients are willing to. Eat. You know, I, I take my patients through an education and I, I first start off reprogramming, explaining cholesterol. And, you know, my, my, my question to them, I says, listen, your body's making 80% of your cholesterol. Why would God, are we allowed to mention that God? Uh, why would God give you a body that's making so much cholesterol if the only purpose in cholesterol is to kill you? And it just doesn't make sense. So what possibly can it do for you? And I take them through that. And in my mind, the the two things that you have to do with any type of mental illness is take a step back and get them off the sugars and get them on the saturated fat. And one other thing, you know, as a as a hospitalist for many years, you come in with asthma, you come in with uh, any type of COPD, we look at your magnesium and give you two grams of IV magnesium sulfate without batting an eye because it helps. They did studies where they gave people who were severely depressed magnesium, magnesium sulfate, IV every day. And in a month, their, their depression was gone. Their anxieties were gone. And there's, you can Google this and you'll look and Going on between the saturated fat and replacing magnesium, people do better. Now, which is the best magnesium in the world? I'm still trying to, I, I, I don't have a handle on that. You know, I probably, if I'm, I'm looking at anxiety and I'm looking at uh, depression or problems with sleep, I push them through magnesium L3 and 8. Is it really what they say? Who knows? But I get them on it, and it does seem they're calmer, they feel better. And with the animal saturated fat, it, within a month or two, they're feeling better. They're more optimistic. I see an incredible improvement. I think, you know, that was, that was you know, people gave Paul Saladino, the, the skeptics give Paul Saladino uh, a real hard time because what should he know? He's only a psychiatrist. And I laugh at that. Because for years and years and years throughout medicine, the only real medicine was psychiatry. <laughs> and uh, and it makes so much sense that most of this mental illness is coming from some sort of nutritional deficiency. With regard to uh, one of the things that people are really concerned about is this ApoE4 variant and its association with Alzheimer's disease. And there's a concern All right, for saturated so- fats. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's, I, I go back that it's 
A A P O four and L P little A. They're both being mislabeled. It's an observation out of context. First of all, if you have more cholesterol, if you have more LDL, you're going to have more APO. And the same thing, LPA, you know, you've got the studies out there say it's not, it's not an acute phase reactive, but it is an acute phase reactive. And in fact, God forbid you, you do have some sort of infection or heart attack or some sort of episode trauma about day nine, 10 or 11, the LPA little a goes up. It's part of the healing process. If you don't have cholesterol, if you have low cholesterol, if you have a low total cholesterol, a low LDL, your all cause mortality is higher. That's the health heart, you know, oxymoron. How come people who have low cholesterol are still dying of cardiac disease? And it, it's so to me, the triglycerides and the HDL are inversely related. Your, tri, your, your triglycerides goes up, your HDL is going to go down. And nothing, nothing but getting off the sugars and increasing the, your animal fat, have I ever seen that ratio change. And the idea that to go out and exercise, people are exercising wrong, in my opinion. And I did it for years wrong. And, and, and where I'm going with this is if you're consuming the saturated animal fats and you're not doing the sugar, you're going to see your triglycerides come down, your HDL going up. And we know that is the most correlated to actual coronary artery disease and the extent of coronary artery disease. So if your ratio came out to about four to six, you've got serious heart disease. You've got serious coronary artery disease. And when they go and do the cath, they're going to see it. Well, as if it's, if you're way down below two, you're doing great. But you're, when you're in that position, you're going to see a high APO. You're going to see a high APO B and you're going to see a high, uh, LPA in your, when they check you, when you check the blood. And those are, you know, we're, we're going back. You, you got to get beyond the, the standard explanation that cholesterol is bad. It's being mislabeled. You know, as someone who has seen a lot of the older folks and, you know, some people will say, well, it's reverse causality. And the reason their LDL goes down is because they've got cancer, they've got heart disease and it's, it's chewing up their LDL. And that's why it's all reverse causality. But I see a number of these studies where they're looking 20 years out and, and people with higher LDL cholesterol do better when it comes to all cause mortality. What, 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 when you Absolutely. saw, when you saw high functioning geriatric patients, I mean, assuming that you see some of them, what do you see? Is there, is there some relationship between LDL cholesterol and their ability to function? Again, I'm burying myself here. I, there, there's another reason why I like working in the geriatric population is because most of my patients who are above 75 in managed care they're already written off, meaning that I don't have to prescribe a cholesterol lowering medication. I'm not saying the class purposely. Um, and when you, you know, like even throughout any type of illness, you need that cholesterol. That's your first line, your LDL, your palomicrons are your first line of defense against any type of infection. And if you don't have them and they're really low, you can't fight. You're, 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 you're like, it's like you're fighting with your hands behind your back. So my high fuck, the, the ones that did the best were lean and active physically and, um, pretty much were not big eaters. The ones that were the healthiest, my 105. I, I ask them all the time, why do you come see me? You've got nothing wrong. There's, you've got nothing. Your blood pressure is better than everybody in here. Your cholesterol, you know, it's a little high, but you're not, we're not going to put you on anything for that. And, uh, he had zero health problems. 105 mentating beautifully played tennis every morning, just phenomenal. So my answer is we're, we're dictated. There's, if you don't have somebody who's out of the box 
And if they're working in managed care and you're under the age of 75, you have, and you've got high cholesterol, the answer is you've got to be on a certain medicine. And that medicine is going to promote cardiac disease. I know I'm blasphemous now, right? Okay. But you're going to, you're not going to reverse coronary artery disease and your all cause mortality is probably higher. You're more like, how many times have I put an elderly patient who wanted it because their cardiologist told them, put them on a certain medicine and they started having mental issues. It happens more than people realize. And the answer is, we don't look at the medicine, we blame it on the, 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 it's the age of the patient and it's just supposed to happen. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's uh, there's some, I guess, relatively short-term data that they've done on PCSK9 inhibitors where they bring people's LDL cholesterol down to even as low as 20 milligrams per deciliter, which is just, I mean, it's unheard of low. And their claims is it doesn't have an impact on mental or cognitive issues. But again, it's a very short-term data. I'd love to see, I mean, not really. They, they have never, first of all, when you put them on there, what's humorous is that the, you know, we just mentioned a few minutes ago where we're talking about the little, little LPA or LPA little a, and you put them on PSK nine and they're, that's going to bring that right up. To me, that's a marker of inflammation trying to fix the, the damage you're doing with this. You're, 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 you're shortening the lifespan by going on that medicine. You're not, there's no evidence that those medicine, that medicine, that class of medicine reverses coronary artery disease. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I think the early trials in that actually showed increased all cause mortality with the PCSK9 inhibitor. It did. If I'm not mistaken. It did. Yeah. That's that absolutely it did. Yeah. it's kind And of- yet. I I know, you know, I've had these conversations with good friends of mine that are cardiologists. They're, they're believing that it's doing something. But in all the years I've been, I I was, I've been a doctor now for about 30 years. I have never seen anybody with coronary artery disease reverse their coronary, coronary artery with what we've been doing for the last 30 years yeah that's that that would i mean obviously uh the 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 plant-based advocates will point to dean ornish's study which was i mean in my view i mean you look at the quote-unquote reversal it was within the statistical measurement of the of the the exam they did it didn't show any signal it was like it went from like 41 percent stenosis to 38 percent stenosis which is literally indistinguishable has actually really done anything and it was, you know, of course, there was all, all the other lifestyle modifications that occur. So, yeah, I, I don't know that we've seen coronary artery, artery disease reversal with any of these drugs for sure. I, I believe that Dr. Ornish's study was flawed and too short to show anything of real significance. And I'll just mention that, you know, he was one of the cardiologists that when I was back in my childhood of internship, um, we studied under, and I'll just remember all the, all, all the fellows were desperate to come to the internal medicine, uh, medical review because the lunches in the cardiology suite were all according to Dean Ornish and they were dying to have pizza. So, uh, <laughs> so nobody, it, it just, it, it's, it's, it's wrong. And I, I really believe if, if you, you know, you go back in history, you go back 120 years, we did not have coronary artery disease like we have today. And the argument would be, well, people didn't live as long. Well, people are living longer, not because of medicine, really. We, we keep them going. But the major thing that has really changed society is sanitation. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, clean water, for access to f- fresh water and, and sanitation. Clean water, is, sewage has made a huge difference. Yeah, that's probably the biggest biggest change to life expectancy that we've you seen. Know, of, and then, and I'll give credit to the antibiotics; they've yeah. helped a lot here and there. Yeah. But that's the major that's the major improvement in our, you know, medicines. And we've been locked into, you know, we we just we don't use critical thinking anymore. Yeah, we well a lot of a lot again. It's it, healthcare has largely become a, a big business, and it's it's very much financially right. I will say, and I'm just going to comment. I'm going to call out Drew, one of, one of your colleagues, uh, Drew Iman, who's I think very close to you in Florida. He's here watching, younger guy, orthopedic surgeon. So it's good to see more and more doctors sort of realizing hey, Drew. this. 
that uh, that uh, I think he might even be in Boca or somewhere. Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're somewhere in that neighborhood, if I'm not mistaken, but somewhere in that area. But it's good Drew to see. Has, uh, I'm not sure which planet, but I see like the sun or a star coming in the background. Yeah, in the yeah, background, so yeah. I was I, I would never know he's in Florida. I thought he was outer space. Yeah, it could great be, but, background. No, I think he's real close to where you are, if I'm not mistaken. But um, anyway, so it's good to see, and we're and the reason is because we're, we're we're running close on time here, and I unfortunately, you know, we we have a hour available for this stuff, but. Where, where, if people are interested to find out more about your perspective, or, or are you doing anything on social media, or how do people get a hold of you these days? You know, the answer is my 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 phone number, my personal phone number is out there, and they can find it. I have no problem giving it out. Uh, I haven't been on really on social media, and I've actually kept my head low um, during COVID. I treated people all around. I consulted for people all around the world. And I was fortunate to get three letters from the American Board of Internal Medicine (laughs) telling me to, you know, that if I'm sure everybody that is boarded got some sort of letter like this. I I, want to believe that. But basically telling us if we talk about anything that's not part of the accepted messaging that we would be looking at issues in the future. And so it was a very threatening letter. So I, as a result of that, I mean, just enjoying people like yourself commenting every now and then when I, you know, that I love it, or maybe I think differently a little bit here and there, but I, I've been chicken. So I haven't gone to social media. Well, you're here now. And so, I mean, yeah, I know I really, I've committed myself. Now. You're out now. You're outed. <laughs> <laughs> you're at it yeah. as, as someone who's willing to 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 think freely i guess i guess it's kind of a crazy thing now i guess it's becoming you know there's some i know on twitter they've sort of opened up quote unquote free speech again supposedly <laughs> supposedly we'll still see what happens but yeah it is it is tough and i i commend you guys and any any of the physicians that have been willing to just just have an open mind and push back a little bit and i think that's something we need we need all need to do so good for you for doing that well, I, I, I came on because I was really looking forward to talking with you and sort of meeting through here. Yeah. I think you're doing a fantastic job. And I think that if you're if someone's having health problems, any health problem, go carnivore, go keto, get into ketosis. You know, just before I hung up here, there there was there's a couple patients out there who are type one diabetics. Something that I thought would not be, you know, from my knowledge base would be how can you get a type one off insulin, et cetera. And there's a couple guys out there who are apparently are really just doing the carnivore and barely taking any insulin at all. And things are getting better and they're starting to potentially, I guess, make their own insulin. Yeah. I mean, I've looked at this as a possibility that I see autoimmune disorders and cancers as a a response to bad nutrition or lack of nutrition and that if there's a genetics screw up down the line it's because we're not getting the what we really need or we're taking on a toxin and if you take away the toxin the body fixes it yeah, it's interesting. I mean, certainly I've seen a number of diabetics, you know, particularly in the honeymoon phase where they've not had to go on diabe- on, on insulin or they're able to come off or, or people who are longstanding who've been able to dramatically in- decrease their insulin utilization. But just as importantly, more importantly, they're avoiding the complications, the retinopathy, the nephropathy, the, the vasculopathy, the cardiovascular disease, which I think is ultimately what we want to do, whether or not they can manage to get off their, their medication or not. And the sad thing about this kid in Canada, he's a 23-year-old type 1 who's developing complications, retinopathy and vasculopathy, and they're just saying, okay, we'll just go ahead and kill yourself, where I'm like, my gosh, you could put the kid on a carnivore diet, feed him steaks for six months, and probably it would it would give him his life back. It, it, cha- it, will, it will be amazingly changed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope here in America that the pendulum swings and that we don't follow the route that some of these countries are going. I mean, you know, there's that, we need medical freedom. Yeah, for sure. 
it's worth fighting for. And I hope we all, and I and thank you for, yeah. for mentioning that. Cause that's a topic that I think I'm very passionate about, although it's sometimes, you know, you get in trouble, you know, you get censored and deplatformed for talking about some of this stuff. Yeah. And, but I think we need to continue to fight. So thank you. I unfortunately do have to go. Thank you for so much. Uh, Dr. Gone, Brian, you're doing been, awesome. Keep I'm going to keep up. it up. I'm going to keep it. I'm excited. You know, we've got, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited. We're going to have an autoimmune study on diet on carnivore coming out. I think I know there's some people that from Harvard that are going to, they're going to take that on and, and we're getting funding and we're getting meat supplied. I'm working on getting that done. And so we'll just keep, keep pressing on and we can do this anyway, guys, I got to go. You guys have a great day. Thanks so much, Dr. Brian. Drew, Y'all have a great Drew, day. Get my number from Sean. Okay. Call we'll see I'll you guys. You. We'll see you guys back tomorrow. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Now.